Thank you so much, Thank you, Professor Levinson, and to all the organizers, Price, and all of you for making the time out of your busy day at the end of a very long day, I'm sure, to learn with us tonight and to be here and honor the memory of um, Dr. Yadida Selman. One of the biggest crises in all of ancient Jewish history took place in 537 BC. And this is not a year actually that does go down in history. I see some of you shaking your heads. Mm -hmm. We know of 597 to 586 BCE. These are the years of the Babylonian exile. In 597 BCE, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar invades Judah and exiles the, uh, the people of Judah. And it takes about 12 years for that process to become complete. So we know those years, many of us, 586 BCE, the fall of the first temple. And maybe we know 175 to 164 BCE. This is the period of the Hasmonean rebellion and the famous war, 167 to 164 BCE, that culminates in the successful rebellion of the Hasmoneans and the establishment of uh, an independent Judean monarchy for exactly 100 years. Uh, the Roman general Pompey invades Jerusalem in 63 BCE. Maybe we know that year. Maybe, well, I'm sure we all know 70 CE, the fall of the Second Temple, 135, or Kokhba. Uh, but 537, maybe, no. Um, so what, what is it about this year that's so important, that's so pivotal, and why do I think that it produced maybe the greatest crisis for the Jewish people in the ancient um, world? Um, the reason why I think this is a very important um, year, well, in order to answer that question, we really have to set the scene. Um, the year before 537, it's 538. These aren't, <laughs> I'm not great at math, the bad can do. Uh, in 538 BC, the Babylonian Empire falls. The great king, the Persian king Cyrus, defeats Babylon. And this is really the end of the story for the great Babylonian Empire. And Cyrus, this great Persian king, does something really remarkable. He practices what today we would call religious tolerance. And he says to the Judahites who have been in exile since whatever it is, the 590s, the 580s BC, he says to the Judahites who are now living along the banks of the Euphrates River and the Tigris River, he says, you can go back. Now we're going to call this province Yehud, but it's all the same, Judah, Yehudah, Yehud. You can go back to your homeland and you can rebuild your temple. This is in 538 BCE. Now the Judahites in exile, they're very excited. They can't believe it. The promises of their great prophets, the great Jeremiah have come true. They've become fulfilled. This is it. We're going to now embark on this process of restoration that was promised to us three, four generations ago by the great prophets. And so we have very famous leaders, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, and Ezra. It's debated when exactly these figures lived and were they contemporaries. Uh, if you look at the book of Nehemiah, you'll see that they're together um, bringing the people back to the land and beginning this process of restoration. Scholars say that maybe Nehemiah was before Ezra, but in any case, these are famous figures who are uh, beginning this process of getting all the Judahites who are living in Persian exile to return to the land. And they begin to pack their bags, they close up their shops, they empty their drawers, their Ikea drawers, they <laughs> pack their panels, I'm mixing all kinds of anachronistic images, um, and, and, and they're ready to go. And they look around their little neighborhoods um, on the banks of the Euphrates, and no one's interested. No one's interested in coming with them. You have a couple hundred thousand, what we'll call now Judeans, although this is very obnoxious with scholars do, when, when they talk about the first temple period, they say Judahites. And then the early second temple period, they say Judeans. And then that Hellenistic era, they say Jews. And we can talk about the politics of that transition, but all right, we'll play along. So the Judeans, now they're Judeans. And the Judeans are totally uninterested because life is pretty good under these new Persian rulers. Right? They're allowed to practice their ancestral laws, whatever that would look like. They're gathering together, maybe to share their scriptural traditions, maybe they're practicing some kind of biblical law, maybe some kind of dietary law, we really don't know at this early stage, but life is good. They're also offered opportunities to, to integrate into cultural, political, economic life. Why, why go back? And so they don't. Why go back? And 
so you have this crisis in 538 and 537 BCE. Judeans, many, many of them stay. Now, some of them do leave this eastern region. Or I guess it, it's the eastern region of a later Hellenistic world, but the, this region of the world, some go west, but they don't go to the land of Israel. Judeans start to settle in North Africa. They settle in what will become Antioch uh, to the north in modern day Syria. They go to the Greek islands. They go all across, all along the Levant, all along the Mediterranean coastal line. And about 43,000 of them go back to the land of Israel. That's disastrous. That means that the project of Ezra and Nehemiah to convince all the exiled Judeans to return to the land of Israel is an utter failure. And this produces a massive theological problem, maybe the most pressing theological problem that Jews ask themselves in the Second Temple period. And that problem, that question is very simple. Is the exile over? Is it over? On the one hand, by 515 BCE, the Second Temple is built. That's pretty good, right? And all, we'll still call them Judeans, I almost said Jews, all Judeans now have the option, if they want, the mobility to return to the land of Israel, if they want, and live in proximity to this temple. But it's also clear that the vast majority of these Judeans are making a choice to not go back to the land of Israel. And so we begin to see a rift. And the rift is roughly demarcated along geographic lines. We have Jews who have returned, uh, I did it, Judeans. <laughs> I just don't know how meaningful the distinction is because when we talk about it in Hebrew and Aramaic, they're UD, right? Okay, uh, in any case, so those in Yehud, the Judeans in Yehud say, exile is not over. But Jews outside of the land of Israel say, not only is exile over, but God is thrilled with us. Things are great. Look at all the divine beneficence we're enjoying. And they don't say diaspora because that word did not exist yet. But in these lands abroad, we are participating in public civic life. We're doing pretty well financially. We are also able to identify with our ancestral practices. This is all a sign that God is very happy with us. And the Judean Jews, Judeans say it's not enough that the temple that once fell, that had fallen, is now rebuilt <laughs> in order to be absolutely certain that the exile is over and in order to really concretize the promised restoration, all Judeans need to return to the land of Israel. And Judeans begin to develop this idea throughout the Second Temple period until by the late third century BCE, they have a word for this idea, a word that encapsulates the notion that if you aren't, now I can say Jew, a Jew living outside the land of Israel and making a choice to not live in, in, in the homeland, if you are such a Jew, you're an embodiment of both sin and punishment, mm -hmm. and you live in a space that encapsulates negative theological meaning, and the word for that is diaspora. Diaspora, scattered seeds. Now, this word is very rare. It only appears in 15, by my count, in 15 places in all of Second Temple Jewish literature. 15. And we've got thousands of pages of Jewish texts from this period. 15 texts, 15 passages use this word. And all of them are written or produced by Jews in the land of Israel. I haven't found a single, I'm glad you're reacting that way, because it's interesting, right? I haven't found a single diasporan text that uses this category or this word or thinks of the idea. The first time we see the word diaspora is in the Septuagint, and this is a little controversial. I'm calling the Septuagint Judean. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause parenthetically to, to talk about that. The Septuagint is um, a translation, not the only translation, but a translation of the Pentateuch, of the Hebrew Torah, um, it's produced in Egypt and Alexandria in the late third century BCE. It becomes very popular, the authoritative translation that Greek-speaking uh, Jews are using in their synagogues. 
um, and in their gathering places. This is the text that uh, Greek speaking Jews study and um, extrapolate um, and interpret. And, and yet I think um, this, well, not just me, but many scholars believe that the Septuagint has cultural ties to the land of Israel. And there are many traditions uh, starting in the late second century BCE that recall the circumstances in which this translation is produced. And these traditions um, describe the translators of the Septuagint as being Judeans. They come from Judea and they go to Alexandria in, amidst great fanfare. The king Philadelphus II, Ptolemy Philadelphus II, welcomes <laughs> these 70 or 72 translators and puts them on this island, Pharos, the famous lighthouse island off the coast of Egypt. And there they produce this grand, majestic, authoritative translation. Um, so it's in the Septuagint where we first find this word, and we find it in a passage in Deuteronomy at the very end of the book, in a very long and um, upsetting passage about the terrible curses that will befall the people should they stray from the covenantal laws when they reach the land promised to them. And so in Deuteronomy 28, this is not in your source sheet, um, in Deuteronomy 28, 28, which lists, it's not, I don't think it is. Um, I had pity on you because the original source sheet was like nine pages long. Um, but you could, you know, everyone has a phone, you can look this up if you're interested. But in Deuteronomy 28, we find this very extensive prediction of many, many curses that will befall upon the people. And we're told God will put you to roots. That means God will, you know, kick you out. You'll run away from your enemies. You will march out against them by a single road, but flee from them by many roads. And you shall become a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Um, in Hebrew, that's the zalva You'll be a zalva. It's not a very common word in Hebrew. You'll be a source of horror. Now, the Septuagint does something very interesting with this phrase, zalva, and it says, you shall be in dispersion, in a diaspora, in all the kingdoms of the earth. And that's the first time we see the word, um, not just in ancient Jewish literature, but in all Greek literature. The Greeks did not use this word. They had a verb form of diasporan, but they didn't have a noun. So it seems to have been invented by these translations. Now, I don't intend to provide an analysis of every of each of the 15 times in which the word appears because I don't know how interesting that would be. So I'm going to just say a few more sentences about uh, these references to diaspora and then we'll look at some Judean texts. Um, all of the references that I could find to diaspora except for two are in texts that were ultimately preserved in the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint, we think of as one book, but it's really not. The Pentateuch was produced in the late 3rd century BC. And then over time, other books of the Hebrew Bible and the scriptures were translated and then added. And then by the early common era, it's coagulating into a single cohesive collection. But the word diaspora always is used in a negative context as a punishment, um, as a divine punishment. And the diasporan texts that engage with the theological meaning of Jewish life outside the land of Israel use neither the word nor the idea. They don't accept the idea that they're living in a state of divine punishment. To really understand this dynamic of how Jews in the land of Israel and how Jews outside the land of Israel are talking to one another about the theological meaning of life outside the homeland, we really can't just study every passage that uses the word diaspora. That's not sufficient. We have to look beyond. And we have to look at some other key sources that I'm going to uh, home in on um, this evening. I'm going to home in on a particular moment in the Hellenistic era in which all the anxieties of 537 BCE resurface. And that's the end of the second century BCE. So now I have to set the scene again. After the successful Hasmonean rebellion, in the 160s BCE and the establishment of an independent Jewish monarchy, Jews in Judea, like their predecessors, like Ezra and Nehemiah, they're very excited. They're very optimistic. The establishment of total independence brings them back not to earlier times of Ezra and Nehemiah, but actually to first temple times. Because 
In the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, the people rebuilt their temple, but they did not have complete independence. They're living under Persian rule and they're paying taxes. But now the Hasmoneans have achieved complete independence. Maybe this is what God wanted. Maybe this is the moment of restoration that did not occur in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Maybe this is the moment that Jeremiah and those prophets of old were predicting when they imagined a future restoration. Now we really need those Jews to come back. They just have to. But again, disappointment, right? We have no evidence of any mass emigration, any mass return, or what we might call a mass uh, Zionist movement <laughs> to the homeland. <laughs> Shouldn't get contemporary, <laughs> but it's hard sometimes not to. But there's no evidence. Now, they did write checks and send $18 to plant a tree in the north. <laughs> um, but they actually did send a lot of money. We have a lot of evidence for that. So Jews in the land of Israel are waiting for some kind of return, and it doesn't happen. Now, at the end of the second century BC, they begin to write their diasporan kin letters. And we have those letters. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's exactly the response I was hoping for. We have the letters. And not only do we have the letters, but we have them dated, which is very unusual. It's like a golden nugget. We have these dated ancient letters. And I'm going to show you two of them tonight. Now, the, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem who produced the letters that I'm going to show you tonight are specifically interested in the Jewish community in Egypt. And the reason is, is because outside of the land of Israel, Egypt actually holds the highest concentration of Jews. Philo of Alexandria, who lives from around 20 BC to 50 CE, says that there are a million Jews in the vicinity of Alexandria. That's probably an exaggeration. He's not going around telling you to check off the Jew box. But you can imagine that there were easily hundreds of thousands of Jews. And actually, he has a very vivid image. Philo says that the city of Alexandria, but this is later, of course, because he's writing 100 years later, he says it's shaped like a pie. And imagine five pie wedges. And every wedge is a neighborhood. And every neighborhood is named after a letter of the Greek alphabet. So you have neighborhood alpha, neighborhood uh, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. And Philo says all of delta is Jewish, but there are synagogues in every neighborhood of the city. So if you can estimate the size of Alexandria, you can estimate at least 20, maybe up to 30% of the city uh, has Jewish residents. And so we might call it the New York City of the ancient world, the Lower East Side of the ancient world. When I go to Teaneck, New Jersey, I say the Teaneck of the ancient world. <laughs> but I don't know if that resonates. I don't know. I mean, it was a very cosmopolitan uh, and, and a very, I was going to say very friendly home to the Jews, but of course uh, there were some hiccups. Uh, in any case, there are hundreds of thousands of Jews in Egypt who are, of course, living under Hellenistic Egypt. Um, in the late second century BC. And Jews in Jerusalem are very interested in these Jews because first of all, there's proximity. If these Jews in Egypt wanted to go back, they could, and they don't. It's not such a hard, it's not like going all the way to the Tigris River. I mean, Egypt is around the bend. Um, and also because these Jews, contrary to what um, many think, especially when we talk about Hanukkah and the history of the holiday, these Jews are not Hellenized. In other words, they're not completely assimilated into Hellenistic life. Now, they embrace aspects of Hellenistic philosophy, and they're happy to participate in certain cultural and political and social aspects of Alexandrian life. But we have every reason to believe that many or most of these Jews are observing their ancestral laws as well. So they're keeping what would have been the main identifying markers of Jewish practice in the ancient world. They're observing the Sabbath and their own calendar. There was no seven day week in the ancient world. So that was very strange that every seven days they would just stop. And they, um, they practiced circumcision on their sons. Greeks thought that was very barbaric. You're mutilating your babies. You can't perfect your soul if you don't perfect your body. And so you're preventing your children, your babies from achieving perfection of the body. Um, and they kept dietary laws. The, the, the Greeks and the Romans thought that that was antiquated, irrational, barbaric. Um, and so and the, the Jews did these things, and they were criticized for that. But mostly we see a lot of optimism that even those Jews who observe these ancestral laws believe that they could successfully integrate into their broader Hellenistic world. In any case, Judean Jews write letters to these Jews in Egypt, and they know that these Jews are probably not going to move. 
do you ever go onto social media and see the come home Jews, the come home? You know, you, you have a friend in Israel who says only in Israel. No, no one has a friend like that. I have a lot of friends in Israel and they have, they, they, you know, they really, really want an in-gathering. Um, but the Jews in the land of Israel were very pragmatic and they did not expect that. So they wrote letters and, and, and they lowered their standards. They didn't say come back to the land of Israel. They said, we want you to show your fealty. We want you to show your loyalty to the land of Israel by affirming that what took place to us in 164 BCE was miraculous. And you're going to do that by observing a brand new holiday. It doesn't even have a name. Many centuries later, it'll be called Hanukkah. Right now, they have no idea what to call it. But you're going to keep this holiday as an affirmation that God intervened in Jewish affairs to establish God's central home in the land of Israel. And so in keeping that holiday, you will not only be showing fealty, but you will be affirming Judean exceptionalism. Can you do that, please? Thank you. <laughs> now, I, 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 um, <laughs> I have a time limit, so we have to dive right in. Um, the goal is to do three sources. We're going to focus on the Judean sources. Um, and so the, we're going to focus on, on the two letters and then maybe a text <clears throat> from the uh, Greek version of Ben Sira that's contemporaneous with those letters. And, and I don't think that we're going to get to the diasporan text inside, but I'm going to give you a high level of view of what, of what they're all about. <clears throat> so these letters suggest that the establishment of Hanukkah, first of all, takes generations for this uh, holiday to catch on but it's a platform upon which Judean Jews can argue for Judean exceptionalism and for the centrality of the temple. We're just gonna go right in. These letters were appended in the early first century BCE to a book that's known today as Two Maccabees. Two Maccabees is preserved in the Catholic canon and um, in the Apocrypha. And two Maccabees is a history of the Hasmonean rebellion that's produced in the late second century BCE in beautiful Greek by a diasporan Jew um, who probably was not, or actually certainly was not an eyewitness to the war. It's a very theological work. He has his own sources that he's working with. And two Maccabees, we're gonna put all of that aside. We are not discussing that for today. <laughs> Forget everything I just said. It's totally irrelevant, except for one thing. An editor or scribe who is copying over two Maccabees in, let's say, the 80s or 70s BCE had these letters, copies of these letters in his possession, and said, the scroll that I'm writing upon, upon which the scroll I am, it's the end of the day, the scroll upon which I'm writing, deserves a great introduction. So rather than just starting with this book, two Maccabees, I'm going to copy these letters onto the scroll, and they will serve as an introduction to the book of two Maccabees. So now, anytime you open up a book of two Maccabees, and you can easily find um, not good translations online, um, the book actually does not start until chapter two, verse 18. That's the beginning of the book. Chapter one, verse one through 217 are comprised two ancient letters that an editor in the first century BC <coughs> copied onto a scroll. So the only reason why we have it is because it was added to a scroll of two Maccabees. All right. So now we're ready. Except I'm going to think of another three preambles, but no, we got it. We, we got it. All right. I thought of another. <laughs> this text is preserved in Greek, but there is consensus that it was written in a Semitic language in Aramaic or Hebrew. The Greek has a Semitic flavor, Semiticism. So if you reverse translate the Greek back into Hebrew or Aramaic, it reads much better. And so there's consensus that these were written in Aramaic or maybe Hebrew. Okay. The Jews in Jerusalem and those in the land of Judea it makes me think that they were like, well, first we'll represent ourselves, then we'll represent the people in our city. No, let's just throw all of us in there. All of us we write to our Jewish kindred in Egypt. Greetings and true peace. So that's a good example. Shalom Tov, that reads 
nicely in Hebrew, that would be sort of a standard greeting. May God do good to you. And may he remember his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, his faithful servants. And here's where I think it gets a little passive aggressive, but you can disagree. <laughs> may he give you all a heart to worship him and to do his will with a strong heart and a willing spirit. May he open your heart to his law. Right? It's like if you have a really condescending friend who's like, oh, your house is so messy, but I just, I hope for you that, I don't know, I'm not good with these metaphors, but I hope for you that you can get more organized and clean your house because I know how hard that must be that you're a slob. So, okay, I just made that up. But I'm saying this, this business of making open your heart to his law and his commandments suggests that their hearts are closed. And you can imagine a Jew in Egypt, an observant Jew who keeps dietary law on Sabbath and practices circumcision, reading this and being like, I, don't know, I, don't know. I thought my heart was kind of open. But, um, but it's also important to note that law is not a good translation here. The Greek is nomos, and that is the word that Jews used for Torah. So he's not saying, they're not saying, open your heart to God's law. Uh, it's much more expansive than that. They're saying, open your hearts to the Torah and the commandments in the Torah. It's very expansive. And may God bring peace. All right. And then one more verse. Um, may God hear your prayers and be reconciled to you again, suggesting some kind of conflict. May God not forsake you in a time of evil. We are now praying for you here. Mm -hmm. I mean... Again, they were like, I don't know, we thought things were kind of fine. Um, this is a very long prayer for such a short letter. Writing, um, writing letters was an art. It was, a, it was a widely admired skill in the ancient world. And there were certain rules. And it was very standard, very typical to open up with a greeting and a blessing. But to devote over 50% of a letter to, oh, may God forgive you and may God open your hearts. It's long, right? Because actually the rest of the, of the letter is, is quite short. So let's put that very long blessing aside and look at the actual request, the content of the letter. That's the introduction. Now they get down to business. In the reign of Demetrius, in the 169th year, we wrote to you. This is not our first letter. We already contacted you in the critical distress that came upon us in those years after Jason. I don't know if you've ever read one Maccabees or two Maccabees, but Jason is a notorious Jew in Jerusalem who's a Hellenizer, and he welcomes Antiochus for Epiphanes, and he kills his enemy Menelaus, and he's, um, he's, he's reviled by the more pious Jews who are resisting the Greek invasion. So um, in the critical distress that came upon us in those years after Jason and his company revolted from the Holy Land and the kingdom and burned the gate and shed innocent blood, we prayed to the Lord and were heard, and we offered sacrifice and grain offering, and we lit the lamps and set out the loaves. Okay, so we wrote to you. Now, this, uh, this dating, 169, how do we calculate what year that is? Anybody know? Because obviously they're not counting down. So they're counting, from the yeah? From the founding of Rome? No, uh, well, from the beginning of the Seleucid era, from 312 or 311 BCE. So that's what they're counting down, from the beginning of the Seleucids. And so that gets us to 143 or 142 BC. So we wrote to you in 143, the winter of 143 or 142. We told you all about Jason and his goons and how they brought terrible suffering upon the people. And God listened to us. We prayed to the Lord. We were, we, uh, were heard. We offered sacrifice and grand offering. We told you this whole story of the Hasmonean rebellion that took place in the 160s BCE. Now, please keep the festival of booths in Kislev. This is a very awkward and clunky name for a holiday, but that's what they called it. Sukkot, Tabernacles in the Winter. They didn't call it Hanukkah yet, but that's what it is. Um, and so, so there are many reasons why they associated this holiday with, with a Sukkot. Uh, there are some links, there are some images in Zechariah that link the, um, the menorah with this, uh, with this holiday. But it could also just more simply be that when they recovered the temple in the winter, they reinstituted the holiday that had most recently not been observed. 
So in any case, please keep the festival of booths in Kislev. And then they sign it again in the 188th year. This is a gold, a gold mine because we've got two dates. This whole letter is in the 188th year. That puts us in 124 BC. The middle of the letter cites an older letter that was sent to Jews in Egypt asking them to keep this holiday in 143. And both letters reference the Hasmonean Rebellion that culminated in independence in 164. So we've got three historical layers. We have the war that's won by the Hasmoneans in 164 BC. We have the first letter that's written to the Jews of Egypt, please keep a holiday commemorating this in 143. And 20 years later, we've got another letter. So we have three generations of Jews eagerly waiting for those Jews in Egypt to do the right thing and recognize the theological significance of this holiday. And they're just sitting around, going into the Agora, walking in the market, buying their, I don't know what Greeks ate in Alexandria. Um, so the undertone here, the implication is that we've been very patient with you. It's, we're in the 120s. 20 years ago, it's not the same letter writers. It could have been their predecessors. But they're producing a sense. They're kind of flattening the history. We wrote to you 20 years ago about what happened to us 40 years ago. They view themselves as part of this community of Jews who are recipients of this divine beneficence. And they're telling these stories to their children and grandchildren. But I'm not convinced that the people who wrote this letter wrote the letter 20 years earlier or were direct eyewitnesses of what happened in the 160s BCE, but this is a polemical message, right? We, the Jews of Judea, have been waiting for you to affirm Judean exceptionalism. And all we get is silence. Why can't you observe this very concretely named holiday, the Festival of Booths and Kislev? Does it sound catchy to you? If somebody asked me to observe that, I would be, yes, I want two of those festivals. <laughs> one in Tishrei and one in Kislev. Um, so we don't have an answer. We don't have a record of an answer. We also have no reason to think that they got an answer. But you can't imagine, again, Jews in Egypt being like, I don't know, some and Aristobulus, you know, good Jewish name in Alexandria, says his friend Demetrius, what are you reading? Demetrius is like, I don't know, like some leaders in Jerusalem want us to, want us to keep the festival booths in Kislev and Aristobulus is like, I don't know. And Demetrius is like, I don't know. And, you know, like we, we have no evidence that it caught on. It takes centuries. Um, for, for Hanukkah to become what we know it today. And of course, we have that famous passage in the Babylonian Talmud, fifth or sixth century question by Hanukkah, why are we celebrating this holiday? Mm -hmm. And even Josephus in the late first century um, asked the same question. He says, yeah, we have this holiday. He doesn't say Hanukkah, he says, we call it lights, and he has no idea why, why they call it lights. Uh, he says, I guess, because things were kind of dark for us, and then God made things light. And you read Josephus, and you're like, Josephus, that applies to every single holiday in the Jewish calendar. <laughs> But the idea that there are different names for this holiday means that there's debate about what the holiday itself means. So with our limited time, let's go to the second, um, let's go to the second letter. This is yet another generation later. We've got the rebellion in the 160s. We have the first letter in the 140s. We don't have the original, but we have it cited. Right? We've got this letter in source number one in the 120s, and now we have a letter in 103 or 102 BC, and again, it's asking Jews in Egypt to please keep the holiday. This is a very complicated letter, um, and I'm going to try to, to <laughs> do it as fast as I can in our limited time. Uh, so again, we have an introduction. We have a much more proportionate blessing here. Uh, again, this is written in Hebrew or, or Aramaic. The people in Jerusalem and in Judea. So again, we have this like, all Jews are writing to you. Um, could have been three guys, but maybe, we don't know. And the council of elders, there's a council in Jerusalem of elders, and Judas. This wouldn't be Judah Maccabee, this would be some guy named Judah. You know, it's a very common name. Two, and now they name a Jew in Egypt, Aristobulus, the tutor of King Ptolemy and member of the stock of the anointed priests. So we're writing to Aristobulus. Aristobulus is very well-known, high-ranking Jew who works in the court of Ptolemy and happens to be a member of the stock of the anointed priests. That will be hugely significant when we get deeper into the letter because the fact that Aristobulus 
is of priestly lineage and he's not living in proximity to Jerusalem or serving in the rotation of the priests in the temple is part of the subtext of the critique of the writers. Aristobulus, what are you doing in Alexandria? You're a priest. Let me tell you a story about your ancestors who were also priests. That's what they're about to do. But let's just throw in all the Jews in Egypt. Yes, we're addressing Aristobulus. We're addressing all the Jews in Egypt. Everybody should read this, right? It's a public letter that should be disseminated wide and far. Greetings and wishes for health. Having been saved by God, from great perils, we think of greatly as befits men who war against the king, for God himself cast away, uh, cast away those who may war on the holy city. Um, so uh, there's there's a kind of intonation here. We've been very patient, right? <laughs> We're four generations out from the rebellion, and once again, we are about to celebrate on the 25th of Kislev. The purification of the temple. That's the holiday, the same holiday as the festival of Booths in the month of Kislev that the other letter refers to. We thought we ought to let you know so that you too might celebrate it as if they had been asking this for six years. <laughs> when Nehemiah, the builder of the temple and the altar, brought sacrifices. Hold on, whoa, whoa, Nehemiah? What, what's Nehemiah doing here? What's going on? We're going to talk about Nehemiah. I thought this letter was going to be about Judah Maccabee and his four famous brothers. Now, the writers of this letter take a different strategy. Instead of saying, we're gonna tell you everything that happened with Jason and his enemies and the temple, that didn't work for you because you're still not keeping this holiday. So we're going to argue that whatever happened in 164 BC was a culmination of a series of miracles that took place at the site of the temple that tells us that God really, really wants us there and we're going to start the letter with a great mar miracle that takes place inside of the temple, not in 164 BC, but in the time of Nehemiah. So now Hanukkah, or what is he called, the purification holiday, becomes not a holiday that affirms the Hasmoneans, who by 103 BC, by the way, were very Hellenized and controversial and often murdering each other. So it's not just to honor the Hasmoneans, but to affirm God's interest in those Jews specifically the Jews who are devoted to the site of the temple and its administration. So we have a story. When our forefathers were being carried off to Persia, he means Babylonia. So when the exile took place in 597 to 586 BC, the priests of that time, you can imagine the writers being like, I'm talking to you, Aristobulus. These are your ancestors. The priests of that time took fire from the altar, right? The temple is burning. The first temple is burning. It's 586, 587 BC. The priests take some smoldering ashes from the site of the altar at the temple and they hide it so that they shut up the place, that the place it remains unknown to all. Years go by and then the exile comes to an end. And Nehemiah says, I remember that when we were being exiled so many years ago, there were priests who hid some fire. Let's go get that fire and we'll bring it to the temple mount and we'll bring a sacrifice even before we rebuild the second temple. And if something happens, then we'll know God's into us. God's happy with, with what we're doing. So Nehemiah tells descendants of these priests who had hidden the fire to recover it. But they find no fire. They only find a viscous liquid. You can imagine some, some kind of sticky tar. They don't find fire right? It's been many years. So he says, all right, you found this viscous liquid, put it on an altar at the side of the temple, and let's, uh, let's, let's wait it out. So they, they, uh, he orders the priest to do this, and uh, they sprinkle liquid over the firewood and over the offerings laid upon it, but they don't ignite it, right? And when that has been done, they let this sit for a while in the sun. It had been a cloudy day, but what do you know? The clouds begin to part, the sun shines and a great fire blazes up to the astonishment of all. This could be the earliest account of a miracle associated with fire that um, <coughs> is used as an explanatory tradition for the Hanukkah holiday. Dramatic pause. Okay. So, so this is a miracle that took place in the time of Nehemiah. Now everyone's shocked, right? The priests utter a prayer led by <clears throat> uh, someone named Jonathan, Jonathan, and he gives a prayer because everyone recognizes this is a miraculous event that has taken place at the temple uh, site. 
Now, again, there's so many layers here. I just want to reframe this. The writers of the letter are telling this story to Egyptian Jews in the late second century BCE to make an argument that the holiday that is going to be called Hanukkah can actually commemorate this miracle and not the miracle of the Hasmonean Rebellion, which maybe was considered to be too politicized or, or not universal, not applicable apologies. But this happened to all their ancestors. Okay, so here's the prayer that Yonatan says. It's a bizarre prayer. I often skip over prayers whenever I see a, a liturgical text and some second temple document. I'm like, ah, prayer, turn the page. But that's not recommended <laughs> because prayer is where the theology is. And this is very important. So look carefully at this prayer. Lord, Lord God, creator of all, awesome and powerful and just and merciful, our soul, good king, our soul provider. All right, he gets a little wordy. The preserver of ex of Israel from every exile. The one who chose and sanctified the patriarchs. Accept our sacrifice for the sake of all your people of Israel. Guard your portion, make it holy. Gather together our diaspora. This is one of the 15 places in Second Temple Jewish literature where we find the word. Gather together our scattered seeds. That's what diaspora means. Free those who are enslaved among the nations. Very harsh and strong language, given that in 103 or 102 BCE, they're not enslaved. They have freedom of mobility. They could have gone anywhere they wanted. But the depiction of Jewish life outside the land of Israel is one of oppression and suffering and punishment. And so here we have this imagining, right? The, the, the fantasy of the Judean writers in 103 BC fantasizing about what Nehemiah and his compatriots were saying about the diaspora. Okay, look upon those who've been despised and abominated. Let the nations know that you are our God. Put to torment the oppressors and the arrogant perpetrators of outrage. Plan your people in your holy place, as Moses said. You can imagine, again, the recipients in um, in Alexandria, being like, gee, oh, <laughs> not that bad. The priest then sang hymns to the accompaniment of uh, all kinds of instruments. I'll skip a little bit. Um, and the news of the phenomenon spread. The king of the Persians establishes the site as a kind of a landmark. The implication here being that the king of the Persians can recognize that a miracle took place here, signifying God's love for the covenant of people. We think we can too. Um, and then the letter goes back in time to the period of Jeremiah. I might go a little bit past eight. I'm really doing my best. <laughs> okay. So in our documents, do you see that? It's six or seven lines down from the top. In our documents, the letter writers tell their Egyptian Jewish friends, we actually found something out. We found out that it was, the Je it was Jeremiah the prophet who commanded those who were being led into exile to take some of the fires, we've just told you. So who was the priest, the prophet, who was in charge of hiding the fire at the very end of the first temple period? It was none other than Jeremiah. And our documents also show that the prophet Jeremiah gave the Torah to those who were being led into exile and admonished them not to forget the Lord's commandments and not to let their minds be led astray when they saw all the idolatrous images and the ornaments. And with the other words, the same effect, Jeremiah exhorted them to not let the Torah depart from their hearts. So first, the letter writers are skipping over the actual Hasmonean rebellion. They go all the way back to the time of Nehemiah. They say a great miracle happened uh, to signify God's desire for the ingathering. And then he goes further back in time to Jeremiah and says, and remember, Jeremiah said to everyone going to exile, don't forget the contents of the Torah. The contents say you have to come back and establish a home in the land of Israel. And then he goes on to say, um, Jeremiah went out uh, to the mountain, which Moses ascended to see the heritage promised by God. That's not Sinai. That's probably the Mount, uh, Mount Nouveau. Uh, in Deuteronomy, where Moses goes and looks upon the land of Israel, but he's not allowed to enter. And so the writers, I'm not going to do this all line by line, but the writers are pushing back and farther and farther into history with references um, to Nehemiah, and then to Jeremiah, and then to Solomon and Moses. And all of these figures have some kind of connection to the land of Israel and, um, and, and to the temple itself. And so if you go to the last um, to the last paragraph, it was Nehemiah who collected all these books that we are citing and we are referencing in this letter to you. 
And in the same matter, Judah, we don't know if this is Judah. This, I'm at the end of the third line in the last paragraph. I don't know if this is Judah Maccabee or the Judah who's writing this letter, probably the latter. Judah reassembled for us the books that were scattered in the course of the recent war. So we have all these books, all this precedent that proves that these stories are not made up. We have all this literary precedent, which is very important in the Greek world, to cite older texts to prove your legitimacy. And if you need them, just ask us and we'll, we'll send messengers to you. If you want to read two to 300 books, we could totally accommodate them. Um, and again, Aristobulus is probably like, no thanks. But as we said, we write you in as much as we are about to celebrate the purification. Please celebrate the days. Subtlety is not their strong suit. Uh, God who saved his entire, entire, entire people and restore the heritage to us all. And then there's some corruption in the text, some grammatical mistakes that suggest that there's some editorial mistakes over here, but there's reference uh, to the kingdom and the priesthood and sanctification. We hope in God that God will speedily have mercy upon us and gather us together from the lands under the heavens to his holy place. So please celebrate Hanukkah as an affirmation that God has done great miracles for the Jewish people who returned, and that God likewise will do great things for you if you become part of that story. And indeed, you already are part of the story because it is your ancestors who received the beneficence and the divine care of God when they made the right choice to return. Um, I'm gonna skip um, source number three, but uh, source number three, is a description written by a Judean Jew who translated a Hebrew book, a wisdom book called Ben Sira. It goes by many names, Ecclesiasticus, Ben Sira, Sira. And uh, the, the writer's grandson, at the end of the second century BC, just around the time when this letter was written, the writer's grandson went to Egypt saw things were no good. He did not like what was going on in Egypt and the Jews were not properly observing their ancestral laws in his opinion. And he translates Ben Sira into Greek. And today, if you look at an English version of Ben Sira, you will see the prologue, the introduction of the grandson and his explanation of why he produces translation and his critique of the Jews who are living in Egypt. Now, in our four remaining minutes, we have to figure out what diaspora and Jews have to say about all of this, but maybe I'll just come back and give us ever talk about that. Um, the bottom line is that there is no evidence that Jews in Egypt reciprocated these ideas. They felt a profound connection to the land of Israel. They supported the land of Israel financially. We know that there's many sources about that, including a famous speech that Cicero gives, I think, in 59 BCE, where he critiques the Jews who are sending all their money to Jerusalem. Um, and we even know that many hundreds of thousands of Jews go on pilgrimage. I think that in, tonight we have some experts on that subject, on pilgrimage. Um, but we don't have evidence of shame. We don't have evidence of guilt. And we don't have evidence of any interest in actually moving back to the homeland. We just don't, it just doesn't exist. Now we do have figures such as Philo of Alexandria, the great philosopher, who again lives from 20 BC to 50 CE, and Josephus, the late first century CE historian, who are very clear about the necessity and the utility of Jewish life outside the land of Israel. And if you look at the second source in the second section, um, Philo of Alexandria says, for no one country can contain the whole nation by reason of its populousness. On which account, the Jews frequent all the most prosperous and fertile countries. It's not a practical um, expectation that all Jews should live in their homeland, but all Jews, wherever they are, look upon the holy city, that's Jerusalem, as their metropolis, their mother city. That's what metropolis means, their mother city, in which is erected the sacred temple of the most high God, but uh, counting those regions which have been occupied by their fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers and so on, that is their country, that is their fatherland. So we have the, I can't, um, where does he say patris? It's in the Greek. Philo uses the word patris, the fatherland, to describe the host country. In his case, that would be Ptolemaic Egypt, and the motherland, the matris. Uh, which is the land of Israel. So Jews in the diaspora have both a motherland and a fatherland. They're walking that tightrope 
very optimistically of dual loyalty. They don't see anything wrong with this dual loyalty. They truly believe that they can maintain fealty and connection to the land of Israel without actually moving there. And Josephus um, likewise talks about the incredible loyalty and devotion that Jews all over the world have for um, the temple. And, um, and he says in antiquities in his big 20 volume magnum opus that recalls the history of the Jewish people in book 14 of antiquities, he says, let no one wonder that there was so much wealth in our temple since all the Jews throughout the habitable earth and those that worship God uh, even in, in Asia and Europe, sent their contributions to it from very ancient times. And we, again, we have Roman, Greek, as well as Jewish sources that attest to the enthusiastic support of the temple that Jews um, provide. And that is why, um, probably the main reason why, Rome enacts the Fiscus Judaicus, the, the Jew tax, after the fall of the Second Temple and the war ends in 73 CE, Every Jew, wherever they live, regardless of whether they're in proximity to Judea, they have to pay a tax, and that tax goes not to Jerusalem or to its temple, but it goes to the temple of Jupiter. That's a polemical argument that these Jews are worshiping the wrong God and, and, and have the wrong royalty. So this dissonance between how Jews in Judea and how Jews elsewhere viewed the theological significance of life outside the land of Israel I don't think it was ever resolved. I think that there's this tension. Um, now, I'm not um, a scholar of rabbinic literature. I only work in early rabbinic texts as they relate to late Second Temple Jewish life. But it does seem to me that the rabbis do try to make a certain effort to mitigate the tension. They don't resolve it, but they do mitigate this tension in a couple of ways. First of all, and I don't have this on the source sheet, but there are very profound Midrashic traditions that imagine God in exile, right? God going into exile with the people and suffering with the people there. And so now the people, wherever they live, have God empathizing and suffering with them um, in the absence of the temple, which has fallen in 70 CE. But more significantly, with that fall of the temple, every Jew is no longer either in the land of Israel or out of, out of the land of Israel, that's not the demarcating identity. Every Jew is in a state of exile because the temple is gone, mm -hmm. right? So you're no longer in a geographic dimension of exile. You're in a temporal dimension of exile. You're in an era of exile. We are all united because we're living in a state of exile that will only be resolved with the coming of the Messiah at a later date. And so that is a uniting force. That's a uniting idea that brings Jews together. We are all living in a state of exile and God is with us in that exile. Um, these two strategies, I think, did ensure um, maybe not a complete resolution of the tension that I've spoken about tonight, but definitely enough cohesion of um, enough cohesion that it um, prevented, I think, um, a catastrophic fracturing of the Jewish people that could have taken place after the Second Temple fell in 70 CE. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think so, yeah. If, we, we, if people have questions, I think we have good time here. Yeah, please. Um, you described the uh, redactor of uh, Second Maccabees putting the letters at the beginning. Where did that? Where did that person uh, write? Were they were they in uh, Judea or elsewhere? We don't know. It's a great question because on the one hand, he's working with a text that was produced in Cyrene in modern day Libya, North Africa. But the text, the, the letters are from the land of Israel. So we, it's a great question, but by the early first century BCE, it could have been in either region. And I don't know, I would look at the scholarship of Jonathan Goldstein or Daniel Schwartz, who have both written on the compositional history of the text. Even two Maccabees is not the original two Maccabees because the two Maccabees that we have it, which begins in chapter two, verse 18, is 
a copier who says the original to Maccabees was five volumes long and I'm condensing it. So we don't even have that original work. We have the condensed version of a five volume work. Um, and then added to that condensed version, we have these letters. So it's, it's lost to the mists of time. I, I, I don't know. Yes, please. Um, this is such a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Oh, thanks. My question is, you said that the word diaspora appears 15 times. Yes. In Hebrew? No. Oh, okay. No, it's a Greek word. And so it appears in texts that are translating the scriptures. Okay. So we find it in the Greek version of Isaiah that ends up being part, added to the collection known as the Septuagint. Uh, we find it in... Um, in True Maccabees, um, in Jeremiah, uh, I think in Jeremiah too. Um, and yes, yeah, scattered throughout these books, the only book that doesn't end up in the Septuagint that uses the term diaspora is a collection of poems called the Psalms of Solomon. Yeah, but they're all Greek, all these, all these are Greek. So then in Hebrew, just the word refers as Galu? So that's an interesting thing, you know, people use Gola, diaspora, Galut as equivalent. And I, I push back on that because first of all, Galut is, is more of a rabbinic term. You don't find Galut in, in the Hebrew Bible, you'll find Gola, right? And so Gola is the space in which the people are sent, right? So, uh, you know, Bani Betocha Gola, I'm in this space. And I, you know, I, I wouldn't translate that as diaspora because it's not all the space outside the land of Israel. It's just specific to the space in Babylonia where the Jews are. Galut, in its rabbinic um, usage, I think has a temporal dimension, right? You're in a state of Galut, we're in an era of Galut. So I try to be careful to not use these interchangeably. And then the question becomes, well, is there a Hebrew version of diaspora, right? If you can't really use Gola, and Galut is later rabbinic, is there a word that Jews are using contemporaneously in Hebrew? And I think, um, I, think I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know of an equivalent that has these valences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, sorry, looking at the, uh, the sources from uh, Jerusalem addressing uh, Jews in Egypt. Um, advising them to celebrate the holiday gladly known as, as <laughs> um, I was wondering how much evidence there was that it was celebrated in Jerusalem uh, consistently. In other words, this is maybe something that uh, periodically they decide they should start celebrating again and then start advising others to, or, or is there evidence that it is uh, celebrated consistently? Um, yeah. Our evidence is very limited. So it comes from one Maccabees, two Maccabees. And Josephus. Yeah. Um, one Maccabees is produced in the land of Israel and written in Hebrew. So it's a very different work than two Maccabees. And I two Maccabees is a very theologically significant work, but that doesn't mean it's a historically archival work. But one Maccabees does seem to have been written by someone who's working for the Hasmonean court and is trying to produce a reasonably accurate account of what happened. Um, and there at the end of the book, he talks about the establishment of an annual holiday. And do we know for sure whether that was an effective um, you know, project and all Jews from that point on in Jerusalem were observing it? I don't think that change happens that way, but we also don't have the evidence uh, to know exactly who and when was celebrating the holiday. By Josephus' time, it was widespread in Judea. Yeah. And, and and to follow up on Ranger's question, and I would say from the rabbinic discussions of Hanukkah also, it sounds right. like it must be pretty widespread if you have first century BCE right. CE sages arguing about you go from eight candles to one or one candle to eight right, right, right. and all that. So that 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 to me, I think suggests that it catches on some somewhere even before 70 CE. You have some really interesting early rabbinic texts. You have Megillah um, Antiochus, which is very hard to date, uh, but it's also it's a retelling of, it's a very kind of midrashically expanded retelling of the story. Um, and then you have references to the holiday. I think Megillah Tani, I wasn't prepared to talk about this, but I think one of the dates upon which that you cannot fast is, yeah. is those holidays, as uh, those dates. Um, and then you have, yeah, I mean, by the second century for sure, it's in the rabbinic imagination. But then the fact that they, are observing it, but 
there isn't consensus exactly about the origin history and its meaning is really fascinating because I think it shows some recognition that different people might have been celebrating it for different reasons. Maybe there are diaspora and Jews who are saying, well, actually, I'm not celebrating this because I'm affirming Judean exceptionalism um, or because, you know, I think that God wants me to, to run back to the Temple Mount. But I recognize that there was a miraculous thing that took place there. Yeah, I think behind you is a question. Oh, uh, I was just curious if the largest centers of diaspora were Alexandria and Babylon from the periods that you're referring to. Yeah, um, the answer is yes. I mean, scholars, I think, problematically refer to these regions as the Western diaspora and the Eastern diaspora, and there's some interesting scholarship on that. Of course, when it comes to the Hellenistic era, we know a lot more about the Western diaspora. Things go a little bit dark in the East, but then, of course, it reemerges with the rabbinic era. Um, so these are the main concentrations of Jewish life. But again, I'm, I'm working with the literature that has been preserved mostly by the Catholic Church. So there's so much that is lost us. We don't have a proportionate representation of literature. Right? I mean, we know that there were non-rabbinic Jews in the second century, maybe millions, but hundreds of thousands of non-rabbinic Jews. We don't have their texts. Doesn't mean they didn't exist. What do they think? What do they believe? How do they practice? Our evidence is so disproportionate. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be careful. Um, and then, of course, we're also at an archaeological disadvantage. I'm not an archaeologist, but we just don't have access to some of these major sites. Oh, lots of questions. Maybe over here, and then we'll go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that at some point there there was arguments and uh, disruption about Hanukkah, and should we celebrate it because it's this very rebellious holiday? It, it could get us in trouble, right? If we if we've got this attitude of you know let's rebel, let's uprise mm -hmm. against the the authorities. Is it possible that that could be? And I don't know exactly when this um this was this debate was happening hmm. um but is it possible that that could have been a part of well what if we claim that it's a holiday celebrating this right. we we have a lot of fun on this yeah. holiday what if we celebrate it in honor of the the tar or what have right. you as opposed to this violent uprising right. that right. uh could very well get Jews in trouble as we are very often in yeah. an oppressed state. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of risks to celebrating this um, rebellion, but I also think in 103 or 102 BC, they, the Hasmonean um, kingdom is still independent, so they're not worried necessarily about what, what their host country is going to say. But first of all, Rome is already on the horizon and they're already um, making treaties with Rome. But also, um, I, I would just supplement what you're saying with the a note that I quickly made earlier in the talk, which is that by 103 BC, the Hasmonean family has lost a lot of the glory and a lot of the mystique and a lot of the prestige that they had three centuries earlier. So adding to what you're saying, I think that it's very realistic to imagine a Jew in, Jude in, in Egypt saying, yeah, I'm not going to celebrate this rebellion, as you say, because we're, we have no intention of rebelling against our own Ptolemaic overlords, and we don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. And also the Hasmoneans, like they're not even, they're fighting with the Pharisees. They're not even observing their ancestral laws anymore. I mean, not in the time of Alexander Janaeus, for sure, who was known to be an enemy of the Pharisees. So I think there are different pieces in play. Um, and then I think that Hanukkah becomes very important in the imagination of the rebels in 66 CE. So when um, tens of thousands of Jews are rebelling against the Roman Empire in the 60s CE, I think they're imagining or hoping that they can reinvent <laughs> another successful Hanukkah story, and that becomes a very powerful image. Yeah, so I think what you're saying is very compelling. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll have the last question. Yeah. Um, I believe that the Jews of Alexandria had a temple. Yes. So, <laughs> Were the Jews of Israel and uh, Judeans uh, trying to tell them a temple isn't right? You need to yeah. come back. And yeah. they're hoping it would. On the other hand, they were living in probably the most civilized country yeah. of the time. And, that, and, that, and, and, and I don't think anything like the civilization that existed in that. Alexandria has ever been uh, reproduced into modern times or early modern times. Right. And, so, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the question is then, 
what was the theological side of a temple in Alexandria? This is an incredible question. So the the temple, so there there's more than one Jewish temple in Egypt. Oh. Yeah. There's oh, yes. yeah, there's yeah. multiple. First of all, there's Elephantine, which is very early, and that's fifth century BC yes. in the island. Um, in the Nile, we, we uh, actually know quite a bit about that because in 1907, there was a cache of papyri that were discovered on the island that had been preserved incredibly enough, and they had plenty of conflicts with their neighbors on that island. Um, and then we have the famous um, temple at Leontopolis. So it's not Alexandria, it's Leontopolis. And that, according to Josephus and many historians, was uh, built by Anais IV, who Konya who was a, a Jerusalemite priest who actually clashed with Jason and his Hellenized buddies in the 170s BC. And he escapes, ironically, he's the observant, kind of the more traditional Jew who escapes from his Hellenized Jewish enemies who want to kill him in Jerusalem. So he approaches Ptolemy, the king of Egypt, and he says, will you support my building of a Jewish temple in Egypt? I promise I'll still stay loyal to the Ptolemaic Empire. And Ptolemy, who needs the support of the local Jews, because he has problems of his own, says yes. So Anais builds a temple that in the 170s, in, or well, actually by the 140s or 130s, is considered to maybe even be more traditional than what's going on in Jerusalem with the Hellenized um, has many families. It's, it's actually quite complicated. Uh, but there's a lot to say about that. And I'm sure that the success and the philosophical sophistication of the Greek speaking Jews in Egypt generated some resentment on the part of Jerusalem. Yes, sure. Yeah. Wonderful. I think that's a great place to stop. Yeah. Thank you.